discussion at YouTube also started right now. New participants are joining us. So I would like to start by welcoming everyone to our 28th online public colloquium of Kadiras University. Today we are very happy and honored uh, to be hosting uh, Professor Kaksiras from uh, Harvard University. Um, in, order to, in order to introduce today's um, conference, uh, I would like to first pass uh, the floor to Professor Nihat Berker. Well, I'm, I'm very excited as if I'm giving the talk. Uh, because it's such a great honor to have and a pleasure to have a long time colleague and a very close friend here in our colloquium. Eftimios Kaxiras has been a, a friend, a colleague for many years now. I don't want to say how many years, but it's more than 20 years. And he was actually uh, the top student in phase transitions and renormalization group theory, the toughest course at MIT physics course. But then he maybe wisely chose to work with my dear friend, John Joanopoulos on uh, ab initio electronic calculations. He did great work there and was a, uh, is, was a great physicist, currently the chair of the Harvard Physics Department. But besides that, he taught me how to play basketball. We played basketball <laughs> together. And furthermore, uh, he, he is the one who first invited me as a friend to Greece, uh, my first visit to Greece and a detailed visit. And after that, I came to love the country, went back many times at collaborations there and we should have more of that obviously. So he is, a, we have a, a great person, a great physicist and such a pleasure to have you there. I'm not supposed to talk long and I'm supposed to give the, to talk the floor to our president, Professor Sondan Durkanol Feiz. And I'm especially grateful to her also, another great friend for uh, supporting these colloquia at, at an international level, which have made such an imprint. Today, we have an international audience. I know I have Jean-Christophe, who's at La Nespa. Uh, I have noticed uh, 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 Jean-Christophe, Costa Surios, uh, Istedo. Uh, we have Greek, uh, Belgium, and other international and from all over Turkey. I've spoken a little long today, so I'm done. Forgive me. And always, the word is yours. Yeah, yeah. As always, I first thank the Nihato Jam for organizing this public series, which brings the distinguished speakers to us, and we learn a lot from different subjects. Therefore, I thank the Nihato Jam. Before I let the floor to our friend Tim, I want to give a brief info about uh, Tim Kaxiras. Uh, dear our friends, in 1987, he took his PhD in physics from MIT. Uh, after completing his PhD studies, he went to IBM Research Center as a postdoctoral researcher. And then uh, he went to Harvard University as a researcher. And uh, in year 2002 and 2004, he was in Greece as a visiting professor at the University of Anina, and of course, as the director of Biomedical Center in Greece. And then after the break, he went back to Harvard again, and he held many, many positions at Harvard. I am not gonna list all the positions he had in, at Harvard. Now he is a full professor in the physics department and in School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. And I thank him again for being part of this uh, public colloquium series. And I let the floor to Tim. Thank you again, dear Tim, for being part of this event. And I appreciate it. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, uh, both uh, uh, Nihad and, and uh, Sundan for this uh, very uh, warm welcome. And thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to uh, give a, a colloquium 
at uh, Kadir Has. Uh, even though it's uh, virtual, I hope someday to be able to visit you in person, like I did a few years ago. And, and uh, I, again, uh, uh, you showed me wonderful hospitality when I visited you at your former institution, and I very much uh, appreciate it. Uh, uh, and and uh, Nihad uh, 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 underestimated a little bit the time that uh, uh, we know each other. It's almost by a factor of two uh, <laughs> larger, <laughs> uh, coming coming almost to 40 years. But uh, and, and it has been a real, a real pleasure to interact with him through uh, uh, those several decades. So I'm going to go to my uh, presentation. And uh, I hope uh, you can uh, uh, see my screen now. Okay, uh, so uh, the uh, talk that I want to give you uh, today is about uh, the physics of twistronics. I'll explain uh, what this uh, new term uh, means, and it has to do with uh, twisted stacked nanostructures. Uh, so we're talking about uh, 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 structures, solid materials that are at the nanoscale, but they are stacked on top of each other, which uh, uh, obviously implies that uh, they are uh, layered. So you, uh, you can only stack things that come in, in, small, in thin layers. So we are working with uh, systems that are essentially exclusively uh, in two dimensions. And this is a very uh, interesting and, and strange uh, situation. Uh, just how strange uh, uh, two dimensions can be uh, uh, is some, sometimes uh, difficult to imagine, uh, but the behavior is quite unusual and interesting. In fact, uh, 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 a couple of centuries ago, there was a, an, a, an amusing book published, uh, which was called Flatland, uh, and uh, the author of this book uh, was uh, A Square. Uh, it's a joke, of course, the, uh, the actual uh, author was Edwin Abbott in the early uh, 1800s, mid 1800s. And he was trying to imagine what life in two dimensions would be like. And he came to the conclusion that all houses will be pentagons because uh, rain would come from the north and would have to go down this uh, way. And there would be separate uh, entrances for men and women. Of course, this was all just uh, um, uh, social commentary, essentially. But uh, it does give a very interesting perspective of how strange things can be if you squeeze the third dimension to essentially nothing and you force uh, uh, everything to happen in two dimensions. Uh, so. Uh, in, uh, indeed, uh, uh, when you squeeze electrons in, in two dimensions and, and make electrons exist only on a plane, essentially a very thin plane, very interesting physics emerges. And this was uh, realized uh, early on. So this is called the two-dimensional electron gas or two deg. Uh, and uh, a lot of very interesting behavior was observed uh, starting in the uh, 80s, uh, the quantum Hall effect, the fractional quantum Hall effect. Uh, a little bit later, the uh, anomalous, uh, the quantum anomalous Hall effect and the uh, edge states in the quantum Hall effect. Uh, actually, the last one is one of my uh, most uh, uh, favorite uh, uh, observations where you have electrons uh, make these little uh, uh, circular orbits when you put them on one plane and you have a perpendicular magnetic field and the electrons that happen to be in the edge form these uh, uh, skipping trajectory. So all this is very interesting and exciting. In fact, it was so uh, interesting that uh, uh, many of these works that I mentioned here uh, were awarded with a Nobel Prize, including von Klitzing and Tsui Stormer and Gosser, Laughlin and Haldane, they all were awarded uh, uh, Nobel Prizes for this uh, very exciting uh, uh, work. So, uh, however, uh, forcing the electrons to be in two dimensions in a single plane is not trivial. It's actually very, very difficult. Or it used to be when we only had uh, three-dimensional crystals available to make that happen. So here's a schematic of how that happens. You put together several uh, uh, semiconductors and insulators. Uh, this is shown here at the bottom schematically. So you have different types of materials. And at the interface, uh, just this uh, 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 plane here where the two different materials meet, there's a well, and in this well you trap the electrons. So I'm blowing up this uh, region here, so 
On one side, there's an insulator. On the other side, a semiconductor. And these plots here show where the probability of finding the electrons. And they're mostly confined very near this interface. So this was very, very difficult to accomplish. The interface had to be very flat, the crystals very pure, and so on. Uh, but uh, fortunately, in the last few years, there has been a cornucopia of truly two-dimensional materials. So this uh, 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 now has evolved to the point where we have uh, semiconductors as layered materials. Uh, and uh, of course, we have metals that uh, prototypical metal is graphene. And uh, we have uh, uh, also other types of uh, uh, materials like insulators, again, coming in layers. We have... Uh, uh, superconductors, uh, mostly layered uh, compounds, and uh, all this is very exciting. And the big question has now become how to combine them to make even more interesting uh, situations, more interesting behavior, to discover even uh, more exotic physics, and also to use them for real applications. And this is a uh, picture that uh, <coughs> Gaim and uh, Grigorieva uh, proposed to think of them like uh, Legos. Uh, so you put one Lego layer on top of another, and we have different types of uh, materials that we can stack and have very interesting combinations. However, as you will see a little bit later, the Lego analogy is not really a very good one, and I will propose something slightly different and, and more uh, interesting, actually quite uh, uh, more interesting. And uh, by the way, uh, uh, Andre Geim and uh, uh, Konstantin Novoselov also got the Nobel Prize for discovering uh, uh, graphene, which is the prototypical of these uh, two-dimensional materials. Uh, so uh, that's the uh, situation that we are facing. And indeed, uh, in the last uh, decades, uh, decade or so, uh, interesting new behavior has been observed, which is now referred to as uh, topological insulators and, and even topological superconductors. And the idea here is that when you force the electrons to um, <clears throat> be in a two-dimensional system. So this is a diagram about the energy as a function of momentum. I'll explain that in a bit more detail in a moment. So the, it turns out that under the right circumstances, the electrons end up making uh, circles, uh, uh, taking paths all around the layer. And uh, those with spin up or spin down, the two little arrows here travel in opposite directions. And that has very interesting uh, implications. So. Uh, this is the kind of uh, general theme that we are trying to uh, address and understand. Uh, and these are the types of materials that I will be uh, talking a little bit more in detail about and the materials that we are using in our research. So we, uh, this is graphene and it consists of a layer of carbon atoms and uh, uh, it has zero band gap. Again, I'll explain uh, the implications of this in a minute, but basically this is a metal. Uh, and uh, this is uh, a rich family of uh, semiconductors. They're referred to by their composition and they are called transition metal dichalcogenides and they have different uh, elements that form essentially the same type of structure and uh, you have different layers again, nicely separated and weakly interacting. And uh, so these are all semiconductors. And finally, we have uh, a very good insulator. This is called hexagonal boron nitride. So with uh, a metal, a semiconductor and an insulator, you can make very interesting devices. And in fact, people have already been able to uh, manufacture real devices. Uh, so here is a nice example from a few years ago uh, by the group of uh, uh, Coppens and collaborators. So basically they uh, combined graphene, those are the green layers up here with these semiconductors in the middle. So this is molybdenum disulfide, one of these materials. And they make a very interesting device where uh, you shine light and then uh, the uh, layers guide the electrons that are excited by the light only in very specific ways. So you can make a very uh, interesting type of uh, device for faster data communication. So it's not just a hypothetical and interesting from the theoretical point of view, the, the materials and these combinations can actually make uh, very useful uh, devices. <clears throat> so uh, a few uh, uh, interesting developments very recently in the last uh, few years have made the whole topic even more exciting. And here's what really uh, led to this. It's the possibility to create a bilayer, but with a relative twist. 
the two layers are not exactly aligned one on top of the other, but they have a relative twist. And you can control this twist angle very, very accurately, which is quite amazing. So this is how they, they do it. So they uh, have a graphene layer, let's say. So this is this thin black line here. And uh, uh, they stick on it uh, uh, another layer. Uh, this is the hexagonal boron nitride. And then they pull up the hexagonal boron nitride and they rip the graphene layer apart in the middle. But by doing so, they now know that the two parts, they know the original orientation of the two parts. So they can bring one part on top of the other at a relative twist angle, and they can control this twist angle down to less than a tenth of a degree, uh, which is really uh, quite impressive. So several groups have been able to do this. Uh, some pioneering work was done by uh, my colleague uh, uh, at Harvard, Philip Kim, but also by uh, uh, my collaborator at MIT, uh, Pablo Jarillo Herrero, but uh, several other groups around the world are able to manufacture these structures. So why are these structures interesting? Well, because when you put one layer on top of another with this slight twist, very interesting patterns emerge. emerge. So here's a pattern that you see. So this is a graphene on graphene. Uh, and uh, uh, two layers, and uh, the uh, uh, twist is uh, uh, about uh, 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 degrees. And you see this pattern, which means that uh, the actual structure of the two layers has changed. It has adjusted to the twisted uh, stacking and produced this pattern of uh, atomic position. So these are not atoms that you see. These are large areas. Uh, but uh, the underlying atomic rearrangement produces this uh, uh, pattern that I'm showing you. Okay, so the question is, uh, what are the implications of this? So this is basically what happens. Uh, imagine that you can take uh, one graphene layer shown here in light blue and another one in light gray and twist it relative to each other uh, by a small degree. Uh, and then you create this pattern that I showed you, which are called moiré patterns. These are things that you typically see when two patterns interfere. And uh, the two arrangements uh, have uh, some kind of quasi-periodic uh, repetition. So it's not truly periodic. Uh, but uh, I should also emphasize that I'm showing hands here, but uh, the scale is very different. Imagine that these hands are approximately 1 billion times smaller than uh, uh, your, your hands. Uh, so we are talking about really uh, atomic scale uh, effects. Uh, so that's what happens uh, in terms of the atomic uh, 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 arrangements. And this is what happens when you try to measure the electronic properties. So what I'm showing you here is uh, on the uh, vertical axis, it's uh, uh, a conductivity, but uh, you can uh, think of this as the density of electrons, how many electrons you have. And uh, the horizontal axis is uh, essentially the energy starting at zero. So this is the... Uh, Fermi energy. Uh, so relative to the Fermi energy, you have a, a lot of electrons here, a lot of electrons here, but you also have uh, big gaps. The areas are shaded by pink and uh, blue here, where there are no electron states. And this is very interesting. And in fact, it was unexpected. And this corresponds to graphene, two layers of graphene with a twist angle of 1.8 degrees. When you put an electric field here, you make these little uh, 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 circles for the electrons, uh, orbits where the electrons move, those are called uh, Landau levels. And uh, these measurements of how the uh, uh, conductivity behaves as a function of uh, the energy are characteristic of the Landau levels. So you have exactly the situation that I was mentioning earlier about electrons on a plane under the presence of an external electric field forced to make these little circles. That's the characteristic signature of the system. And you can reproduce the physics of the quantum hall effects. Those are the observations that led to the many discoveries in the 80s and, and the several Nobel prizes for these uh, exciting discoveries. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> indeed you can observe in this type of twisted layer, this uh, interesting uh, behavior. Uh, but you can actually uh, observe even more interesting behavior. This was uh, uh, a big uh, uh, surprise and discovery a couple of years ago, 
by the group of uh, Pablo Jarillo Herrero at MIT and his collaborators. And what they did is they put such uh, a, a, a bilayer graphene system, two layers of graphene shown here. Uh, the one on the bottom is uh, highlighted in blue. The one on the top is highlighted in, in uh, red. And they measured the current as a function of, uh, <clears throat> uh, actually, sorry, they measured the resistance as a function of the current. So here is the resistance as a function of uh, the current at different temperatures. The different uh, curves here correspond to different uh, temperatures. And uh, as you lower the temperature, uh, yellow is four degrees Kelvin. The black is uh, uh, less than one degree Kelvin. You see that uh, uh, the resistance basically goes to zero. And when you have zero resistance, you have superconductivity. So uh, this twisted bilayer graphene shows the uh, uh, characteristic behavior of a superconductor at uh, this very special angle. The, uh, it was at about uh, one degree. Uh, and uh, uh, having a carbon, basically graphene, behave as a superconductor was a big surprise because nobody uh, expected carbon to be a superconductor. Uh, typically metals are superconductors or some very special compounds, the copper oxides that become superconducting when uh, doped uh, to have uh, also some type of metallic property. Uh, graphene is a metal, but a very poor one. And uh, it didn't, uh, 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 it was not expected to have this behavior, but in twisted bilayer graphene, it does indeed become superconducting. So here's uh, another way to uh, uh, measure this. So again, you see here on the horizontal axis, it's uh, uh, called uh, the carrier density. It is, it's actually the doping uh, and uh, it measures the distance from uh, the uh, zero point of the energy, the Fermi level, and the vertical axis is the, again, the density of electrons, the conductance, which is proportional to the density of electrons. And you see these big humps, lots of electrons here, lots of electrons here. This uh, uh, shaded area is the gap where there are no electronic states. This other shaded area is uh, uh, the other gap uh, where, again, there are no uh, electronic states. And uh, uh, <clears throat> you see also other smaller gaps here. Uh, and all these observations are quite exciting. So this plot shows the uh, nature of the material. It's superconductor in this range. Again, superconducting in this range as you change the carrier density. So this is a blow up of this small region. And in the middle, you have an insulator. And uh, if you, so this is at uh, a certain angle. This is at 1.16 degrees of twist, a different angle. So this is 1.05 degrees of, of relative twist. Again, superconductor, superconductor, uh, metal up here, insulator in the middle, mod insulator, and so on. So this is quite rich and interesting behavior. And uh, <clears throat> it's actually quite similar to the behavior of uh, what uh, are called uh, high temperature superconductors, high TC cuprate materials. Uh, and this is a phase diagram uh, as a function of the doping, the carrier density. And again, you see superconductor down here, different types of uh, behavior, Fermi liquid, uh, uh, non-Fermi liquid and uh, pseudo gap region, which means uh, uh, semiconductor or insulator, uh, quite similar to what is observed in uh, uh, this twisted bilayer graphene. Now the subject of high temperature superconductors is a very rich one. And uh, since these uh, materials were discovered in the mid uh, 80s, the physics community has been uh, working very hard to understand the physics of this, uh, which is not easy. Uh, and uh, the uh, fact that the twisted bilayer graphene uh, shows similar behavior gave a lot of uh, hope and excitement that we'll be able to explore the same physics in a much simpler system, just by taking two graphene layers, putting one on top of each other and uh, giving them a relative twist. These other materials, the cuprates or copper oxides are much more difficult to produce and control. And uh, having this uh, clean phase diagram in these materials is much, much more difficult to achieve experimentally. So we have a new tool for exploring basically the same physics in a much simpler system. So that created a lot of uh, excitement and uh, gave uh, the impetus to uh, uh, new theoretical modeling. So our goal 
uh, has been to build a realistic picture of uh, the single particle states in uh, twisted bilayer graphene and explore or, or any other twisted bilayer system or, or multi-layer system and explore the implications uh, and uh, provide insight and guide to experimental uh, exploration of uh, further possibilities. So uh, I'll uh, give you first a very quick uh, view or overview of uh, the physics of uh, single layer graphene, uh, just so that uh, it's easier to follow the language of what I'm trying to explain. And actually I will start with the language of crystals uh, uh, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. So in, uh, uh, in a crystal, and I'm showing you here pictures of two dimensional crystals. So this is uh, atoms uh, on a plane forming a regular lattice. So this is a square lattice. This is a trigonal lattice. You see these little triangles, which are repeated uh, uh, in the entire plane. And this is a more interesting uh, uh, combination. So you have a triangular lattice of the red atoms, but also you have interspersed with this uh, uh, another triangular lattice of uh, the blue atoms. So these two interpenetrating triagonal lattices, uh, uh, this arrangement is called the honeycomb lattice. So you have interesting types of arrangements, but the essential thing here is that there is one unit cell highlighted uh, here, uh, a square for the square lattice, a uh, a uh, little rhombus for the trigonal lattice and uh, a bigger rhombus for the honeycomb lattice containing two different atoms. And all that you need to know is contained in this little unit cell. And then you can, this unit cell is described by these two little vectors, uh, the red uh, vectors, and you can create other vectors which are linear combinations of the small vectors A1 and A2 a2 that uh, identify the unit cell. And then the physics is dominated by these uh, uh, periodicity, the lattice vectors. So these are, uh, these are the functions that describe what the electrons do. And they have this periodic type of behavior. These are called block states. And because it's a crystal, all the atoms are identical. These states are delocalized. This is very important. In a crystal, all the electronic states are delocalized in the sense that uh, the electrons feel the presence of all the atoms. So that's the first key ingredient. Uh, now, just like uh, you have this periodicity in real space where the atoms are, you have an equivalent periodicity in momentum space. This is called also reciprocal space. Momentum or reciprocal space is the same, uh, uh, are two words used to refer to the same uh, space. So it's the space uh, uh, conjugate to the positions. So uh, for the square lattice again, which is easier to draw, you have one region here, which is called the first brillouin zone. And uh, you can describe what happens in reciprocal space by these little vectors again, which are called B1 and B2 and their linear combinations. And again, any function in a reciprocal space is uh, uh, in, in real and reciprocal space uh, is uh, uh, described in terms of these uh, linear combinations of B1 and B2. And just like in the crystal in the unit cell, uh, the, in real space, in the reciprocal space, you can describe everything that is happening in this first brillouin zone. And what happens beyond this first brillouin zone, uh, like the uh, pink or the red regions, is equivalent in the sense that it can be referred to back to the first square, the first brillouin zone, can be folded back. Uh, and uh, the momentum is described in terms of uh, these uh, uh, other vector K, which is called the pseudo momentum. So the bottom line is in order to understand the physics, you need to be able to describe what happens to the energy of electrons. So here I'm showing you the uh, uh, energy diagram. The vertical axis is the energy. The horizontal axis is the values of this new quantity, the pseudo momentum that I just uh, mentioned, uh, the K vector. And you see that this is the typical behavior of uh, the energy. Uh, and uh, those uh, uh, lines that represent the energy eigenvalues are called bands. And uh, uh, the places where the bands uh, would meet, for example, here or here, uh, they, they split. Uh, so the bands repel each other. So they don't touch. If you were to extend these lines, they would touch here, but the bands do not touch. They split and form these gaps. All these are important features in understanding the physics of solids. And moreover, you can concentrate only in this 
pink shaded region, which is the first brillouin zone, what happens beyond this can be folded back into this region. So that's what we are talking about. I, I will be discussing things that are happening within the first brillouin zone and everything else is folded back in and the behavior of the energy shows you what happens. So the energy is uh, as usual uh, uh, given by P square, which in terms of uh, this new vector K is equal to H square K square divided by twice the mass. This is the familiar expression of P square divided by twice the mass, the kinetic energy of electrons. And this is the uh, 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 one of the important terms. Uh, and uh, you see these bands that are formed here, uh, basically obeying this expression at the band extrema. So here is uh, 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 the energy is H, K, H squared K squared over 2M uh, and the same here, but here the energy is, uh, excuse me, the mass is negative. So these are called holes. Uh, when you have electronic states missing from these places. And these are called electrons. At the bottom of the band, you have electrons. At the top of the band, you have holes. So that's in a nutshell, what captures the physics of uh, solids. And I will be using these terms uh, repeatedly uh, uh, later on. That's why I wanted to introduce them in a simple picture. So back to graphene now, the single layer of carbon atoms. Let's uh, study a little bit the physics of uh, graphene. So in real space, in uh, the space where the atoms exist, you have a plane of atoms. All the atoms are in a single plane for a single layer. And they are arranged in this uh, uh, honeycomb lattice that I described a minute ago. So these are the repeat vectors, A1 and A2. And these A and B are the two atoms. In this case, the atoms are the same element carbon but they are in two different positions and the atom a forms its own trigonal lattice and the atom b forms its own trigonal lattice and the two uh, trigonal lattices are interpenetrating and they form this very interesting uh, honeycomb lattice uh, and uh, <clears throat> the two lattices formed by the periodic images of atom a and uh, the periodic images of uh, atom b are important in understanding what happens when you put one layer on top of the other so that's the real space arrangement. And this is the reciprocal space. This is the, uh, again, a two-dimensional reciprocal space with kx and ky components of the k vector that I mentioned a moment ago, the pseudo-momentum. And uh, the Brillouin zone now is a hexagon because we are dealing with a trigonal lattice. Uh, moreover, because of the high symmetry of the hexagon, you only need to consider what happens in this little triangle uh, that is uh, uh, described by these points, the corners of the triangle are labeled gamma, K, and M, because by applying other symmetries, you can uh, repeat the triangle all over the hexagon and figure out what happens to the rest of the reciprocal space. And again, the momentum is equal to H bar Planck's constant times this uh, uh, K vector, uh, whose components I'm showing you here, Kx and Ky. So that's the situation for graphene. And here's the band structure of graphene, the bands that we can calculate by using exactly this atomic arrangement uh, uh, that I just described. So here are the points that I mentioned, the gamma, M, and K, the corners of the triangle. And the vertical axis, again, is the energy. And these uh, colored lines are the different bands, the energies of the different electronic states. Uh, <clears throat> and if you... Uh, uh, right here, the zero of the energy is the Fermi level. And this is an important uh, value of the energy because all the states below are occupied by electrons and all the states above are empty. Uh, <clears throat> and and uh, uh, this is why we introduced the Fermi level and it's a very important uh, uh, concept. Uh, so the shaded region corresponds to uh, occupied states, the uh, unshaded region to empty states. And here's now a blow up of this small range, but I'm showing you a perspective, a three-dimensional representation. So here's the hexagon that I mentioned earlier. Gamma is at the center of the hexagon and K are the points at the corners of the hexagon. And uh, these are the bands, but now shown as a function of Kx and Ky uh, simultaneously. And of course, when you have two independent variables, Kx and Ky, the bands form these nice uh, surfaces in uh, uh, K space. 
Uh, and uh, this uh, uh, black hexagon is the first brilliant zone that we were discussing a moment ago. And uh, you see the interesting behavior of the bands. However, when uh, people first calculated this and, and uh, showed that this is indeed the case, it was a big surprise because at these corners, the behavior of the energy is not uh, proportional to K squared over twice the mass, is simply proportional to K, the absolute value uh, uh, of K. This is very unusual. This is the kind of situation that uh, no particle with mass can have energy proportional to momentum. Only photons, massless particles, have this kind of uh, 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 relationship between their energy and their momentum. So that's why in this very special uh, case uh, for electrons in graphene, in graphene, they are uh, referred to as massless electrons be because the, uh, of the very special uh, uh, relationship between energy and momentum. Moreover, because uh, the energy increases linearly at all these points, but in different directions. These are called cones. And in honor of Dirac, who first described the physics of uh, photons, of massless particles, these are called Dirac cones. So that's where this terminology comes from. Uh, so graphene by itself, so this is a single layer. It's quite amazing, quite interesting, all by itself. That's why the discovery of graphene in uh, the early 2000s led to uh, the award of the Nobel Prize to its discoverers, Gaim and Novoselov, because uh, uh, this is really a spectacularly interesting behavior by itself on a single plane. Uh, <clears throat> another really important uh, uh, quantity that we will be following is the density of states. So imagine here that on this axis now, I plot how many electrons come from these different bands. So this band contributes a certain number of electrons, this band more and so on. So this curve shows the density of electrons, the number of electrons as a function of the energy. And right here where the Fermi energy is, there are zero uh, states, no electrons here. That's why I mentioned earlier that uh, graphene is a poor metal. There's no gap separating occupied and unoccupied states, but there are no states uh, at the Fermi level. So it's a, it's a metal, but it's a poor metal. Okay. Now, what happens in twisted uh, bilayer graphene? You take two layers, you put them on top of each other, and you form these interesting patterns that I showed you earlier. And uh, uh, in some regions, you have uh, this kind of uh, arrangement. One layer, the top layer shown in uh, uh, orange, is exactly on top of the bottom layer. So you don't even see the bottom layer. So these are regions that are called AA. The A lattice is on top of the A lattice, and the B lattice, of course, on top of the B lattice. Uh, so you don't see the second layer. Or alternatively, in other regions, which are called AB or BA, the top layer, again in uh, uh, orange, uh, obscures only half of the second layer shown now in yellow. So you see only half of the atoms of the second layer. And this is called an, a, an AB or BA stacking. The two lattices don't exactly obscure each other, but uh, partially hide each other. It turns out that uh, this is, if you try to arrange two layers of graphene, this is high energy situation. The atoms don't like to be in this situation. They like to be in these low energy situations, which correspond to the A, B, or B, A stackings. Uh, so this is the real space arrangement. And this is now the reciprocal space. You have two hexagons, one from each layer, the red and the blue. And uh, <clears throat> these correspond to the uh, uh, entire layer. But because now you have this super periodic arrangement, the Moiré pattern, you form smaller hexagons uh, in recipro reciprocal space, which corresponds to the super cell, the larger periodicity. And everything now uh, that we need to understand has to do with this smaller area in reciprocal space, the uh, 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 supercell brilliant zone. And uh, from each layer of graphene, you get these Dirac cones, one Dirac cone, uh, set of Dirac cones from the blue layer, another one from the red layer. So for the black hexagon, the supercell that corresponds to the Moiré pattern, you have Dirac cones at each one of these corners from the two different layers. Now, uh, when you take this picture and, and analyze it a little bit more, so here's a Dirac cone from the blue layer, a Dirac cone from the red layer. If you think about this, uh, uh, extend these Dirac cones and, and uh, uh, look at them uh, in, in this picture, you'll realize that the Dirac cones intersect 
at these points and at these points. And as I mentioned earlier, where bands intersect, uh, uh, they repel each other. So instead of uh, uh, the bands crossing each other here and here, they repel each other and form these new lines. So they open up these band gaps. So this is a very uh, uh, interesting, simple picture of trying to understand what happens when you put the two layers together. And this was put uh, forward by Bistreiter and McDonald back in uh, 2011, and it captures uh, the essential physics, but not in great detail. So here's the uh, density of states again. So this is density of states as a function of the energy, and this is the uh, uh, zero, uh, the Fermi level. These dashed lines are the cones of the graphene layers, the individual layers, and these are the density of states of the new bands formed by the repelling, the splitting of the individual graphene layers. So we uh, decided, we, we made it our uh, goal to produce a realistic theory based on the atomic structure. What I showed you a moment ago was uh, a, a sort of a, a qualitative picture. So we wanted to put together a quantitative picture. So this relies on a very elaborate set of uh, equations called the density functional theory. Nihat mentioned uh, uh, in his introduction, this kind of approach. It's called an ab initio theory because it contains no empirical parameters and it can really give us a very detailed uh, and realistic description of the system. The trouble is that you can only apply this when you have systems that contain about a hundred or at most a thousand atoms. And when you create these uh, twisted layers, you have systems that contain in each periodic cell, large periodic cell, even hundreds of thousands or even millions of atoms. So you cannot apply these calculations directly in this case you have to do something a little bit more clever. So we teamed up with a, system, with a uh, uh, group of uh, mathematicians who helped us uh, visualize this and develop this better. So basically you have these uh, in real space, these arrangements. So these are the moiré patterns of the red and the green uh, uh, layer, but you can see that locally you have different types of arrangements. So I'm blowing up these different regions and you see the relative arrangement of atoms in this region or this region or this region. So you realize that what only matters is the different relative local arrangements. And you can translate everything that uh, we did in uh, uh, K space. So these are the integrals that uh, we typically do in K space to integrals over local configurational space when you take into account over all uh, all these possible local configurations between the two different uh, layers. So having done that, you can do a more efficient theory uh, if you have a finite range of where the electrons are. And uh, this can be indeed accomplished. Uh, it relies on an important uh, uh, computational uh, tool, which is called the uh, Vanier functions. And uh, a very good uh, student with whom I worked, Shang Fang, uh, uh, applied this theory. The original theory was developed by David Vanderbilt, uh, Nicola Marzari, and collaborators. We applied it to graphene and pr produced the localized states. So this is what the localized states look like. So this is a localized electronic state on a single atom, and you can analyze it in uh, uh, sort of higher harmonics. And then you put each one of these localized states in each atom on the bottom layer and a corresponding state on each atom at the top layer, layers one and two, and allow those local states to interact to produce uh, essentially the same physics the, with the same accuracy as the first, uh, uh, the ab initio calculations. So uh, then we were able to do calculations for very large systems or containing of order millions of atoms as these periodic cells at a large scale uh, require. And another student, a very good student that I worked with, uh, Stephen uh, Carr produced this plot. Uh, so this is uh, now a plot of the density of states on the vertical axis as a function of the energy on this axis and as a function of the twist angle on this axis. And, that, and then you see that at zero twist, you have this density of states of graphene. Let me reproduce this. This is the plot that I showed you again, but now uh, uh, 
are flipped over to correspond to this plot. So this line here is the same as the cross cut of this, but blown up. And you see here the zero density of states, again, zero density of states at the Fermi level. And this is at zero twist. But if you increase the twist angle a little bit, about one degree or so, a little bit over one degree, you see this huge density of states at the zero value of the energy. And that's what's extremely important and extremely useful. If you have a huge density of states near the Fermi level, you, it means that you can produce uh, very interesting behavior by supplying a few electrons at uh, near the Fermi level, which is easy to do, and explore the behavior of this large number of density of states uh, uh, electrons. So when we realized this, we came up with the name twistronics, namely that by simply manipulating the twist angle, you can change dramatically the density of electronic states, the ability to populate states near the Fermi level, which is the essence of all electronic devices. Uh, 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 in a nutshell. So we came up with this uh, fancy word to describe this. And uh, 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 interestingly enough, this uh, word uh, caught up. So uh, other magazines picked it up. Uh, so this is an article from uh, Physics World, uh, to Histronics tunes 2D materials properties. And then this is another article from Wired Magazine. Uh, physicists are bewitched by twisted uh, uh, graphene at the magic angle, the coming age of twistronics. Of course, we were very happy and, and proud to see that the community adopted this nice term that we introduced. It even has its own uh, Wikipedia uh, entry uh, and the field is blossoming. So what happens uh, actually? So let me show you uh, uh, two different uh, uh, views of this. So this is actually one of the pictures that uh, Nihat uh, put in this uh, nice poster for my colloquium. So this is what happens to the atomic position. So these are the two layers uh, and I'm showing you uh, the different uh, arrangements of the atoms. So in some regions, the atoms have the uh, A, B or B, A arrangement. And these regions are close to each other as shown here. So in, in these regions, the two layers attract each other. In other regions, the atoms have the AA stacking that I was describing a moment ago. And in these regions, the atoms repel each other. That's why I'm showing these as little mountains and these as little valleys. So this is how the atoms relax, reform themselves, readjust themselves uh, under the overall twist that we have imposed on the two layers. And uh, this has important implications for the electrons. So this is now a, is a band structure. So these are the different bands uh, that correspond to this uh, atomic arrangement. And you see these two bands here near the Fermi level at the zero, and you see how flat these bands are. And flat bands give rise to very high density of states. Uh, and uh, uh, if you did not include this relaxation, uh, as uh, was done earlier, before people could do these detailed calculations, you get this mess of electronic bands, which is not correct and not realistic. So the relaxation is very important. The second thing is uh, how the electronic states change as a function of twist angle. So here I'm showing you the uh, Dirac cones as they evolve as a function of twist angle. And you see that at uh, a magic angle at about 1.1 degrees, you get these very flat bands. I'll play this uh, uh, movie again. So the movie starts with uh, a, uh, the Dirac cones uh, that I was showing you earlier at a relatively large angle, about three degrees. The hexagon and the Dirac cones, those come together as the angle becomes smaller and smaller at about one degree. The bands, instead of Dirac cones, become very flat. Those are the flat bands. And okay, so these are the flat bands corresponding to the magic angle. And flat bands, just like those shown here, correspond to high density of states. That's where the high density of states comes from. So this is all very, very exciting because the first thing that it uh, uh, occurred to us, uh, this is work by my uh, student Stephen Carr and, and uh, uh, other members of my group, is that uh, uh, these are the flat bands that I showed you a moment ago, the highlighted uh, uh, flat bands uh, at uh, an angle of 1.12 degrees and zero pressure. Uh, but uh, at a different angle, uh, 1.47 degrees, the bands are not so flat. At two degrees, the bands are not flat at all. But if you ap apply pressure, 
because of the uh, analysis of the relaxations that we did, you can make the bands flat again. So uh, going down this axis, you apply, you compress the layers. So this is 5% compression, which corresponds to a certain pressure. This is 10% compression. So you start with flat bands uh, here. You, the bands at larger angles are not flat, but you can make them again flat. So this is the magic angle, the angle at which the bands become flat uh, uh, and this changes as a function of the pressure. This is the pressure in uh, gigapascals. So this was a prediction from our theoretical, detailed theoretical analysis. And this is actually experimental work about a year later uh, after our prediction. So this is the prediction that we made. And this is the measurement. Experiment finds that at 1.27 degrees, uh, that's the magic angle. You again see this large density of states and superconductivity, but at a pressure of 2.21 gigapascals, and this is extremely close to the uh, uh, predictions of the theory. So that's why having a detailed atomistic based theory can provide this powerful tool for making useful predictions. So what about the superconductivity that I was mentioning? So here's again the plot that I showed you earlier. This is the density of states. These are large gaps at the two endpoints, and these are smaller gaps at the middle. So one hump like this corresponds to a uh, complete band. This is another band. Uh, and these are small gaps within the bands. Now, this is very peculiar behavior. If you have a single band and it's completely filled, that's the density of states as a function of uh, uh, the energy and a filled band would correspond to something like that. A half filled band would correspond to something like that, but no gap. In order to get a gap, you have to have behavior different than the one that I was describing before. You have to have correlated electrons. Up to now, we've been talking about electrons behaving as independent particles. Now you have to have a correlated electron system where each electron uh, sensitively depends on the behavior of all the other electrons. So in order to capture this behavior, you have to go beyond the density functional theory that I was describing earlier. So this requires a so-called many particle picture, many body picture. And this behavior here where you develop a gap uh, at half filling of the band is referred to as a Mott Hubbard insulator. So uh, this is difficult to capture. That's why uh, 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 it uh, generated a lot of uh, interest and quite challenging. This is a nice uh, schematic picture of it. It's uh, uh, from uh, the Physics World magazine about a year ago, a little over a year ago. And uh, it, uh, it says, I'm quoting here, for the time being, we only know that all the correlated states come from the electron-electron interaction. Their ground states and interaction mechanisms between these quantum phases remain a mystery for now. So this is the other question that we tried to address. And this is the other picture that uh, Nihad uh, kindly also included in the poster. So what we can do with our theory is understand the nature of these electronic states. So these are the bands again that I was showing you, the two bands near the Fermi level, which are pretty flat. So this is uh, at an angle of 0 0.9 degrees. Uh, you see the flat bands, and now we can take these flat bands and project out of these bands the different components of the electronic behavior. So this plot here shows you the different components of the electronic behavior. There are actually four different columns and a final one at the end, uh, fifth. Uh, the first column is layer one, lattice A, then layer one, lattice B, layer two, lattice A, and layer two, lattice B. And these uh, uh, color, uh, color coded images show you where the electrons are. So, uh, so they're in different places, in different layers and in different arrangements. So these are near the spots called AA. These are near the spots called AB or BA. These are at the boundaries between AB and BA uh, spots, which we call the walls. So by projecting out all these different contributions, you can visualize where the electrons are. And from this, you can construct these kinds of correlated electron pictures. Now that you know where the electrons are individually, you can create correlated wave functions between them. Uh, and uh, this is what uh, we have been trying to do. This is not a trivial task, uh, so I don't have time to go into this uh, in more detail. 
So instead, I'm going to show you something very uh, recent and uh, even more complicated and potentially even more exciting. So this is uh, the picture that I showed you about the bilayer graphene, the two Dirac cones that, uh, coming from uh, layer one and layer two, and uh, the bands uh, splitting here, uh, repelling each other and forming these, uh, uh, the cones uh, uh, splitting at the intersection and forming the flat bands. And uh, now here's what we would have if you have three layers of graphene uh, stacked on top of each other. So you have three different Dirac cones now, all of them again interacting, and at these uh, points where the bands uh, 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 meet, where they intersect, they would form again uh, 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 splitted bands. So you would have this kind of arrangement and this kind of arrangement and so on. So this suggests that uh, the situation with three layers, three different cones is a little bit more complicated, but potentially more interesting also, flatter bands, more bands to play with and so on. Uh, uh, now notice that here you have two different angles to adjust, the angle between the first and second and the angle between the second and the third layers. So the, things, uh, the, the system becomes much more complicated and the cell size here scales as one over the angle, the angle being small, the cell size is big. In this case, the cell size scales like one over the angle square, the angle being small, the cell size is much larger in this case. And indeed, this is the kind of uh, uh, relaxation that we see here. So let me just show you this first. So this is another very good student that I'm uh, working with at uh, the moment, Zoe Zhu. And she produced these relaxation patterns. This is layer one, layer two, and layer three. Layer two is in the middle. And you see that layer two is a very weak pattern, but layer one and layer three have stronger patterns of relaxation. And you can calculate also the local twist so this is what the bottom uh, pictures show you. So we call this a moiré of moiré. So you have a double moiré pattern, not just the moiré of uh, the original uh, 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 layer, uh, which is uh, sort of in the middle, but the other two, which are the superimposed super lattices. So this creates a very complicated situation. Interestingly enough, this also shows superconductivity. So this is a plot similar to the ones that I showed you earlier for bilayer graphene. Again, here you see the, uh, 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 the resistance as a uh, function of uh, current, and uh, you see this flat region, which is uh, 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 zero resistance, uh, superconductivity. And these are the domes, the superconducting domes, the regions where the superconductivity uh, appears. Moreover, the critical temperature at which this occurs is three and a half degrees. Uh, almost a factor of three larger, higher temperature to observe superconductivity, which is always desirable. So this is very interesting and very promising. The trouble is that it's also much more complicated. Now you have three hexagons to play with. You can scan the regions here in K space in different directions. These are the bands in two-dimensional, excuse me, in, in uh, bilayer graphene. Uh, and these are the bands in trilayer graphene with lots of more, many more bands, much, much more complicated. And here you see flat bands again. Here the flat bands are uh, 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 interspersed, are uh, 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 cross-linked with other bands. So this much more complicated situation gives us the... Uh, idea that uh, things can be more uh, flexible in trilayer graphene. The superconductivity at higher temperature is very promising. And because of uh, no gaps anywhere, you see here in bilayer graphene, you have gaps. Uh, so you can isolate these layers and uh, produce this uh, correlated behavior the Hubbard insulator. Here you have no gaps anywhere because of the many more available bands that cross each other. So no Hubbard insulator. So the physics is different. Not only it's more complicated, more flexible, but even more challenging and interesting to understand. So uh, I think I have uh, uh, used up all my time. 
I'll stop here. I just want to give credit uh, to all the people who do who did the hard work. I already mentioned the contributions of uh, my uh, uh, students, uh, Shang Fang, uh, Stephen Carr, and Zoe Zhu. Uh, Shang is now a uh, postdoc at Rutgers University. Stephen is a postdoc at Brown University, and Zoe is still working with me. This is a picture of the group, uh, which was uh, also included in the poster. These are other members of the group who also contributed significantly to this and related projects. And this is a list of our collaborators, experimentalists, the mathematicians, mathematicians that I mentioned briefly, and other theory co uh, colleagues who, with whom we are working closely to understand different aspects of this problem, including many body correlated behavior uh, of the electrons. Uh, these are the sponsors of this work. I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Professor Kaksiras. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of interesting questions piled up during your presentation. Uh, maybe Professor Baker would like to start. Uh, thank you very much, Timios. Great work, uh, beautiful work, and uh, deep work, deep and beautiful. I have a simple question. In these systems, uh, would at the same time as superconductivity, do you also see antiferromagnetism? Uh, no. Uh, this is a very, very good point, a very interesting uh, uh, question, uh, and thank you for bringing that up. Uh, Antiferromagnetism exists in the other types of uh, superconductors that I mentioned that are also layered, the cuprates, but not in this system. I believe the reason is that uh, uh, there's no uh, the easy way to create magnetic states in graphene. It's the physics of carbon uh, that uh, makes that uh, different. Uh, but there may be other systems uh, layered again, like the transition metal dichalcogenase that I mentioned earlier, uh, which you can, uh, uh, for which you can create uh, twisted layers and uh, hopefully dope. There are indications that there you might see similar superconducting behavior, and there you had a you would have a much higher chance of also observing uh, uh, magnetic behavior but not in graphene, as far as I know. But very interesting point, it has purely to do with the strange physics of the carbon atoms. Thank you uh, for your answer. We have some hands raised here. Um, Professor Bengi uh, Azur, uh, would you like to pose your question? Um, just could you turn on your mic? Thank you very much for this amazing presentation. And it's opened a new horizon for me and my students, thank you. And I'm working on composites with uh, two dimensional metal uh, like calcogenized into polymers. And I have a question about the superconductivity. And you explain how graphene is superconducting when folded at uh, zero degrees or Kelvin at angle of one degree or something. And using the basic of your theoretical approach, uh, would it be possible to fold the graphene at different angles in this way to obtain a superconductor with a highest uh, critical temperature? Uh, as you know, the highest critical temperature record belongs to mercury cuprate superconductors, and it's about 130 uh, or something degree of Kelvin. Uh, for example, if it were a superconductor operating at room temperature, it could be replaced of all this semiconductor technology. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. This is uh, uh, a great question. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, bringing it up. Uh, let me uh, please, uh, if you allow me to share my screen again, I wanted to show you something interesting. I had another picture that, uh, oh yeah. By the way, uh, let me just show you this very quickly. So this is molybdenum diselenide, one of the types of materials that uh, you just mentioned. And you see similar type of behavior, localized uh, states here and, and uh, bands and, and so on uh, by doing this kind of uh, twist. Uh, so this is uh, at five degree twist, which is easier to achieve and therefore more promising. Uh, and there's another thing that I want to show you. The actual temperature is indeed uh, low uh, and uh, you can't uh, change that temperature easily because uh, it's controlled by uh, the intrinsic interactions. However, the, uh, the, if you scale that temperature 
by the Fermi temperature, essentially by the velocity of the electrons, the, uh, which is the more meaningful comparison uh, to give you a sense of uh, how strongly correlated the system is. So if you scale the temperature, the magic angle twisted bilayer graphene shown here. So this is the ratio of critical temperature over the Fermi temperature. So the red dots are the values for the magic angle twisted bilayer graphene. So this dashed line is the high TC cuprates. This dashed line is the iron pnictites, and this is the iron selenide. So these are considered all very high temperature superconductors. In this scaled temperature, the uh, graphene is uh, very high, which means that these correlations are very strong already. So it's not possible to range the absolute value of the temperature easily in graphene, but hopefully we can do it in other systems or with a multi-layer graphene. As I showed you, the temperature in multi-layer graphene is a factor of three higher. So this is around one degree. Uh, so in bilayer, in trilayer, it's a factor of three higher. So it's really strongly correlated systems and possibly also by intercalating other atoms by using uh, uh, techniques for uh, uh, doping graphene with different types of uh, intercalation atoms. So we have hopes that uh, this could lead to these effects of raising the temperature in pure graphene due to the nature of uh, carbon atoms. Again, the absolute temperature is low, although the scaled temperature, which is a signal of the strength of the correlation is quite high. Okay. Thank you so much for the answer and the question. We have another raised hand, Oz Gülseren. Um, would you like to turn on your mic to pose your question? Uh, thank you, Professor Kassiras. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, so the one is regarding to this three-layer graphene system. You show the beautiful band structure. So the question is, how robust is the band structure with respect to the structural relaxation? So did you achieve the structural relaxation? The unicell is quite large. How did you manage that? So this is the first question. The second question, uh, in, instead of uh, homo bilayer, uh, is it possible to observe hetero bilayers uh, and uh, what happens to the, the drug cones uh, and so on? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you for the questions. These are excellent points. Yes. Uh, uh, again, if uh, you permit me to uh, share my screen for a moment, uh, so the the uh, picture that I want to show you is uh, uh, again this uh, uh, image of uh, the uh, trilayer graphene, and what you see here is indeed this very uh, complicated. Uh, uh, version of uh, the band structure due to the three layers. Now, the uh, uh, interesting thing here is that uh, uh, in, in this particular picture, we have not yet included relaxation, but in more recent work, we have indeed. And uh, this is not trivial to do because of the very large number of atoms, as you mentioned, but we have a very special way of doing that, that I didn't have uh, 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 enough time to describe. So let me just uh, very quickly outline what happens. So essentially what we do is the following. So, uh, so it's uh, shown here schematically. You take one ideal layer, no twist, one ideal layer, and you put on top of it another ideal layer, no twist, very small unit cells, and you slide the two relative to each other. And by sliding, you explore all these possible energy landscapes. And uh, having created the energy landscape, the gradient of the energy landscape, which is shown again here schematically, gives you a picture of the relaxation. So here is the energy landscape, and here is the gradient of it, which gives you a sense of the relaxation. And by this trick, we can get the effective relaxation on all the atoms we have without having to do the explicit calculation. We then impose this uh, effective relaxation, which is very accurate, from the gradient of the energy landscape and we can do the band structure. But again, we need large unit cells for the band structure itself. Because we're using localized bases, we can handle this. It just, uh, uh, we haven't uh, uh, compiled all the results in, in, some, in a comprehensive picture yet. Uh, so this is a, a very good point. Uh, and uh, uh, 
uh, I think uh, it uh, addresses your first question. The second question has to do with different uh, hetero layers. Yes, indeed, you can stack different hetero layers. When you do that, things become more complicated because the interactions between the layers is not, are not that simple anymore. So you have to work a little bit harder to devise, to calculate the accurate interactions between layers. We are in the process of trying to do that, but because that's so complicated now, different types of uh, layers, different unit cells, different arrangements, we have to work much harder to understand the interaction between such different hetero layers in order to provide a reasonable and accurate description. So we're in the process of doing that, but it takes a, 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 a little bit of time and hard work. Thank you so much for the question and the answer. Um, are there any more questions? You can pose them yourself, you can write it on the chat, um, or any comments you would like to share. Sondon Ojam, would you like to uh, comment? Uh, Tim, I have a question actually. Uh, as far as I know, I may be mistaken though, uh, you know, having a single graphene sheet, experimental is not easy. They are waving and you put the two of them and two them. Is it easy? I don't know. When you talk to experimental people, uh, the, the graphene sheet, they are waving in, uh, and I don't know how they manage it. If you, if you can say a few things, I would be happy. Yes, uh, absolutely. That's another excellent point. And thank you for bringing that up. In fact, I had a picture about that, but I didn't have the chance to describe it in more detail. And uh, uh, let me find the picture uh, because it's exactly like you described yes. it. Okay, yes. so this is what real graphene looks like. Okay. Yes. However, what they're actually doing is uh, slightly different. And if I go back to my uh, uh, picture of the experimental uh, setup here. So here it is. Let me just uh, show you what happens here. So they actually have uh, a, uh, uh, here you see, they have a hexagonal boron nitride on a smooth substrate. Hexagonal boron nitride is very stiff and very flat. And they stick that on top of graphene. Then they tear up half of the graphene and move it over and put it on top of the other. And on the bottom, they have another layer of, uh, uh, hexagonal boron nitride. And it's this sandwich, the hexagonal boron nitride, very flat layers on the substrate that keep everything else completely flat. Very what? good point, but that's how they manage to do that. Okay. Now the good. hexagonal boron nitride is a large uh, gap insulator. So it has no effect because it's such an insulator. So okay. insulating, it, it doesn't affect anything. So that's the very clever arrangement that the experimentalists found okay. to address this point that you're making. But you, 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 you are raising a very good point. Yes, Excellent. absolutely. Thank you, Tim. Thank you so much. Um, okay. <laughs> Yeah, Thank you very much. Thank you for the uh, invitation, for the very interesting questions, and for the. No, no, I'm asking a question. I didn't say. <laughs> good. Oh. Not, not so easy. Not so. Oh, okay, easy. okay. I thought you were waving. Okay. No, no, no. I'm asking a question. Okay, so, good, good. Again, I'm working on the oxide uh, analogy, and so uh, what would be the impurity, if any, effects on this uh, system, yeah. on the twisted uh, layers? Uh, uh, so, so for, for impurities, what do you have in mind for impurities? The, the doping? Do, uh, well, well, uh, for, for example, other non, uh, uh, foreign atoms, for example. Yeah. Uh, no, as far as I know, that's not an issue in graphene because graphene is uh, uh, a very strong lattice in the plane, very stiff in the plane. It's very hard to include other atoms there. It's very, very difficult. Uh, uh, so so uh, in, in pure graphene, there's no issue. It's uh, basically uh, defect free. Uh, but there's an interesting uh, 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 corollary, an interesting extension of this idea. And again, if you uh, permit me to, to share my screen for a second, I'll show you a picture of what I have in mind. Uh, so uh, uh, 
So graphene itself, as I mentioned, is very, very uh, stiff and strong lattice, very hard to include impurities. So it's very, you can produce it in very pure form and that's exactly what they're using. However, it is possible to uh, insert atoms between the two graphene layers. And these are known as intercalants, intercalation. And uh, I'm showing you here two graphene layers, one on top, one on the bottom, with lithium atoms in between. That's actually how uh, lithium batteries work. Uh, the uh, anode is uh, uh, graphite, many layers of uh, graphene, and you put lithium atoms inside, and uh, that's when it's charged, and then you extract the lithium atoms, and then that's when it's discharged. So uh, because of the relaxation pattern that I was showing you, the little mountains and the valleys, we have suggested to take advantage of that and intercalate lithium atoms, which will be stuck in small regions and that would play the effect of uh, impurities localized impurities but also controlled impurities you know exactly where they would go and hopefully this would lead to even more interesting behavior under full control of what you are doing if you can control the amount of intercalation and uh, the place where these intercalant atoms end up which is dictated by the relaxation pattern. So, uh, uh, so if you want to work with this type of impurities, I'd be very happy to talk to you, very interested in talking to you more. Uh, uh, me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, are there any other questions? Comments? Yeah, I think another question. Oz, yes, Oz Gülseren Hocam. Would you like to turn on your mic? Yes, thank you again. Uh, I have one more question. Uh, so, with Trivistronics, uh, you always talk about the rotation, but actually it is possible to get the uh, more sort of patterns by uh, translation as well. So is there any experimental studies, especially along that line, it might be much easier to control. Uh. Yes, uh, that's a, a very good point. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I am not aware of uh, studies along this line. Uh, it should be explored. Uh, I think uh, it might be easier to control, but it might not produce as rich a behavior, as rich a structure when you have the twist, because the twist imposes essentially periodicity in two directions. If you only Ro uh, 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 slide, it would only have effect in one direction. So that's my simple minded uh, uh, explanation of why that has been explored, but it is an interesting point to explore a little bit more. Yes. Thank you. Also, John, and for the answer, Professor Kaksiras. Um, any other questions or comments? I'm also checking our YouTube broadcast. Um, we have uh, participants watching from there as well. I think this is uh, all the questions we have. Uh, I would like to thank so much uh, on behalf of uh, Kadras University and all our uh, students and colleagues and all the participants here. And maybe for some last words, Nihat Hocam, Sondan Hocam. Thank you, Tim. It was great to see you. Thank you very much. Efaristo Parapoli. Hello. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. I enjoyed it very much. It was a great hospitality. Hope to see you soon again. Sure, we will. We will host you at Cadillac University. Great. Face to face. Uh, okay, when, when, we're, when we're all vaccinated. Okay. Yes, we will, yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone, again. Uh, yeah. We have our next colloquium um, in 15 days' time. Keep us following on our YouTube channel and our social media accounts. Thanks, everyone, for their participation. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye.